This is the Veterinary Project Podcast, episode 138. Welcome to the show created by vets featuring absolutely no pets. This is the Veterinary Project Podcast, hosted by Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light. Our resident veterinarians have swapped out their stethoscopes in favor of microphones to bring you the Veterinary Project Podcast, a show focused on real conversations aimed to connect this amazing profession full of remarkable people. Through the sharing of collective stories and wisdom and connecting over the many unique challenges we face, we invite you to join our community of veterinary professionals leading intentional lives. And now, here are the hosts of the Veterinary Project Podcast, Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Veterinary Project Podcast. Repeat guest today, Dr. Robin Handley Defoe, all the way back from episode six. Before we get to that, Jonathan seems to be in an exceptionally feisty mood here. So I have no idea where this is going to go, but what is going on your way, Jonathan? Just feeling the energy. And then actually, I'm going to switch gears because I'm looking behind you right now and I'm seeing all these books Woo. getting yeah. it organized behind the scenes, Mike. Well, no, nah, we've. I think we've been in this house since July, and if the camera was pointed at the floor, you would see that I'm still not unpacked. So that's still deception. To come. That's the deception. Hey, it's working according to the podcast world. No, jumping back to the question, lots of energy. Um, amazing what happens when you get exercise in the morning. Uh, I went out for a little squash session this morning. If we're talking about hobbies of life, I don't have too many right now. Um, but being able to get back into squash the last two years has been uh, both mentally and physically very enjoyable. So really competitive match. I ended up losing. But again, it's it's four hours after that match and still feeling the effects of it, which is fantastic. Yeah, I, I, I feel like we've mentioned this before, but back in vet school, there was a group of us that had a squash yep. ladder. And I mean, there was a huge group at one point, like of all, you know, abilities, yep. multiple classes of veterinary students. Um, and that was a lot of fun. I go by that same squash court to take Riley to gymnastics now. And it always, I always have a little flashback. So much fun. And then the social as well as the squash, because really, did we actually know what we were doing? No, but it didn't matter. And what's interesting to that end is on the social piece, I met with a fourth year student this week. We had a great conversation, but she was saying is that for the first time in fourth year, they're really starting to get to know each other because COVID had neglected their ability to meet in person. And I found that such an interesting uh, dynamic to talk about and for her to open herself up to because the last two years, it's been difficult for the students coming out of school, coming into practice and not having as much of that interaction and that collegiality. Whereas you and I, we were lucky at the time that we went to school and we were also social in our beings that 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 was three quarters of the fun. That's what made the hard worthwhile. So I'm I'm happy to hear that the students are back in action again, and it's going to be both helpful for them, helpful for a uh, next generation of employers that need these students to come out and and be able to chat not only with the animals that we love, but the 80 percent that's attached to humans as well. So yeah. talk about I'm that. I'm smiling. It it brings back a lot of memories, and I know a group of uh, us from you know our years, the, the few years around us. You guys all were able to get together here a month or so ago. I wasn't able to make it out. But I just think of that group and I can't help but smile, you know, like lifelong friends, no matter what happens, formed in those, you know, three to four years together. Make it happen. If you have the chance to do that for anybody that's listening, that's in free vet school or vet school, if there's an opportunity to get together, go take it because it only lasts so long and holy heck, is it worthwhile? Yep. We'll get you back out, Mike. Probably a good thing you weren't out there, but less sleep, lots of fun. Yeah, I'll be at the next one. So yeah, let's dive in. As I mentioned, Dr. Robin Hanley Defoe, uh, we're diving into all things stress again. Uh, for those on YouTube, I'm holding up the book here, Stress Wisely. Her latest book is out. Always a great time chatting with her. I mean, yeah. she it's I don't know if we call these interviews. I call them conversations, whatever we call them. She's got to be one of the easiest guests to have on because you can ask her any question and she can make it sound like, oh, that was a great question and tell an amazing story. So always fun chatting with her. 
she's just so kind. I had the opportunity to meet her in person with another amazing kind individual we've had on the podcast this summer in Quebec City, uh, Jillian Carr with Steadygate. And she's as kind in person as you would expect. But in an interview setting, as you said, she makes you feel so comfortable. And that is that is skill. And and yeah, it was it was enjoyable to have her back onto the podcast, especially, you know, 130 some episodes later um, and really enjoyed the content that she's going to provide for us today. Absolutely. So described as one of the most sought after, engaging, thought provoking and truly transformative international speakers and scholars in her field. Dr. Robin Hanley Defoe is a multi award winning education and psychology scholar, author and resiliency expert. She specializes in resiliency, navigating stress and change, personal wellness in the workplace, and optimal performance, both personal and organizational. With over 18 years of university teaching and research experience, and as a TED, TEDx talk speaker, Dr. Robin continues to create accessible and relatable materials while offering practical strategies that are realistic and sustainable. Dr. Robin recently joined a group of highly esteemed authors from around the globe as a 2022 Nautilus Ward recipient with her debut book, Calm Within the Storm, A Pathway to Everyday Resiliency. Dr. Robin has recently released her second book, Stress Wisely, How to Be Well in an Unwell World, in June 2023. I dove into the book. It's fantastic. Fantastic resource. These are stressful times. Enjoy this episode with Dr. Robin Hanley Defoe. All right, Dr. Robin Hanley Defoe, welcome back. I had to dive into our spreadsheet. It was episode six, 2020, when you were last on. I remember the stories you told, but anyway, that was a long time ago. We're so excited to have you back. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for having me back. I absolutely love being part of people's origin stories. So the fact that I was one of the single digit guests while your podcast went single digit, that means a lot. And I'm so excited to see you both today. Yes. On that, I remember I saw you speak in as Jonathan and I were ramping up. We hadn't officially launched yet. Mm -hmm. So you were on the list of like, this will be one of our first guests and she'll come back a bunch of times because... Your stage presence is phenomenal. Thank you. I'm excited for our talk today. Yes. So today we're going to be talking a lot about stress. We're going to be talking about your new book, Stress Wisely. And as soon as I saw the cover, so the subtitle for everyone listening is How to Be Well in an Unwell World, I knew I would open this conversation with my very first question would be, is the world unwell? What a big question. And uh, without a doubt, it is a hundred percent. And it's been very unwell, in my opinion, for lots of different reasons for a very, very long time. And what we're seeing right now is just like crisis after crisis that's just compounding to the point where people are feeling really uneasy on all fronts, um, you know, geopolitical, economical, like there's just so many different things, a human, you know, humanitarian crisis that are becoming part of an everyday news cycle. Uh, the world is very unwell. I agree. I, I wanted to hear your context on it. In, I was coming into my office to hit record with you. And one of my friends just texted me another news article of some yeah. horrific event you know, he's in the US, I'm in Canada, it was right on the border. And it's like, it doesn't end. Like, every single day, there's news and social media and snippets and whatever just coming at us of like, holy man, is this ever going to stop? I have to yeah, be devil's advocate on this. Why not? We're in a conversation. Is it more unwell? I would also agree it is, but is also as a measure of what we're exposed to and the snippets and the social media and the news that's a 24-hour cycle to throw the negative out there as compared to in earlier generations and centuries and even looking past where you wouldn't have been exposed to that same degree, even close to. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Absolutely. Like historical events, we haven't captured them in a 24 hour news cycle that we have seen today, that we see today and we're exposed to today. So, absolutely. I think the world always has been operating in a place of being unwell. What I think what's happening now, which is a wee bit different, is just as you've just described, the, the mass exposure that we are having and just the point where we're being inundated, where there's no reprieve, there's, there's no breaks from 
from it. And yes, historically things, you know, and we can go back as far as possible to see all the things that are not okay. And the reality is people actually got breaks from it, right? People got seasons of rest. They got seasons where everything in their local community and their town and their neighborhood seemed to be okay. And, and yes, we always know that there's other things that are happening, but we got a break from it. Whereas right now what I'm seeing is there's just this relentlessness of the stress and the overwhelm and it's having an impact on people's well-being. I wasn't going to go in this tangent, but it seems fitting. In your yeah. in your book, you had mentioned, I don't know the exact quote, but you know, social media is comparison masquerading as connection, yeah. something to that effect. And I see that on social media. Every time you go on there, looking at everyone's highlight reels, you know, and then it's like, well, they got their shit together, but I sure yeah. don't. Mm-hmm. It's so true. And again, I think that's the dangerous part about social media and why the research and what we're learning from psychology is that there's some critical windows of development for children and adolescents, what, whereby it's actually like more dangerous and harmful because as grown ups, we can look at some of that and have that critical eye and recognize like, yeah, you're showing us your best of, or this is your top kind of your top news feeds or your news experiences. Whereas what we see and what psych, as I said, is teaching us is that for children at certain ages, they don't have that part yet to be able to discern that this isn't reality. So we're really skewing people's perceptions. And then when we sell it as social connection, um, really, I think we're doing a disservice to our younger generations uh, because we're setting them up for failure. I would agree. We're, we're certainly trying to limit exposure to that. I'm trying to limit mine, but it's a work yeah. in progress. Yeah. For you, and yeah. or sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, but what's so interesting and the same, like I really subscribe and part of when we get into the contents of Stress Wisely, there is this, um, what we call this component of dual truth, where like on one side, like, yeah, social media can be really harmful for our children and our adolescents. But then on the flip side, it also could be a really powerful tool. It could be a tool if we know how to use it and put some guardrails around the use. So I can give you an example. My youngest, I have three teenagers. Uh, my oldest is off at uni. My youngest is home, grade 10. Um, his highlight reel from a recent basketball tournament within the first day had 70,000 views. Now I have a social a social team who we strive to get views and like try to get our information out there and this like 15 year old sitting in the passenger seat of my car made a a video on his phone of just capturing these highlight reels shared it on a, on his platform 70,000 views. And then that all of a sudden led to a couple trainers, a couple coaches, a couple people taking notice, started some really, really exciting conversations in our household. There's no way we could have used a different platform to have had that same level of exposure and impact. So again, it's recognizing that there's that dual truth. There's good to it, but we also want to be careful, but we can also put those guardrails up to use it for good. I like that. Yeah. So looking at, I guess we've kind of checked the box that, yep, there's a lot of stress in the world right now. What does it mean to you to stress wisely, you know, as we dive into, you know, the context of your book? Yeah, thanks for asking that question. So one, just to kind of backtrack just a heartbeat, most of my research that I started out was looking at resiliency. It was like this kind of pro act, you know, like this almost like, okay, this bad things happen. How do people rebuild? How do they do comebacks? And one of the things that we noticed is that persons who held this kind of mindset or this kind of worldview that, you know what? bad things happen sometimes, or, you know, some things are going to be difficult. And they had just, again, this kind of more of a worldview of recognizing that there's going to be wins and losses and plus and minuses. It seemed as though that they were more able and had more capacity to navigate whatever it was that was requiring this degree of resiliency. So I started to like get really curious about that. And then I realized that there were some persons who are actually stressing wisely. Like they were actually doing the stressors and managing their stressors in a really wise way. So from that research, that's what really kind of kicked off that curiosity about like, how are people doing this so well? And what can we learn from persons who have been able to navigate all the different seasons in their life? And the first big takeaway that we came upon in my research was that these persons who could, what we call stress wisely, have accepted that stress is inherent to the human condition. 
there's going to be bad days. There's going to be setbacks. It's what we do in those moments that really speak to what's possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's important because a lot of times if someone says the word stress, instinctively, I will probably file that in the negative category. Mm -hmm. But we know it's not always negative. Like stress can be good. It can lead to adaptation and good things can come from that. But I think in the moment we're immediately like, no, that's bad. I want a stress-free life. Yeah. And I hear that so often where people are saying, you know, I'm trying to get rid of my stress or I want a stress-free life. And what's remarkable about it is like our biology is built on a stress system. So our nervous system is completely built on being able to participate and experience stressors. And what's also interesting, our stress is our greatest, greatest defense. It's our first line of defense. It's what keeps us safe. It lets us know what's important. It allows us to be able to show up for ourselves and our loved ones in our communities. So our stress systems, we want to make stress. Again, we talk about this in the book. We want to make our stress responses like as our allies and not our enemies. Um, and yet I think a lot of folks hold that idea that stress is going to hurt them. It's going to kill them. It's bad. Uh, the reality we know that, you know, we can't get through life stress-free. So we might as well kind of think about strategies on how we can work with our stress versus trying to get rid of it. Yeah. One of the exercises um, I was listening on, on audible, but one of the exercises was around your emotional home. And that really, I really liked how you did that because I had never necessarily named, you know, my default reaction. So could you yeah. walk us through, you know, what does an emotional home mean to you? Yeah, I really appreciate that that question. So the concept of emotional home is this idea that many of us have a state or a way of feeling or being that's really familiar. So for some, it could be pretty adaptive and maybe their no normal or baseline state could be calm, or maybe it's a feeling of like accepted or regulated or just kind of maybe more laid back. And that's what they're used to versus someone else, their emotional home, what they're most familiar with could be chaos. It could be really high levels of distress, could also even be something like anger. And what's remarkable about the human condition, as we go through our days, and let's say our emotional home is anger, it doesn't matter what happens, we're going to find a way to get angry because that's what we're just most familiar with. So one of the exercises we often encourage people to do is a little bit of like a little bit of a, you know, a, a review or a reflection of like, okay, what is that state that I notice that I tend to gravitate towards or that I tend to spend most of my time? And if you notice that maybe that state isn't serving you as well as you would hope it could be, perhaps we can think about doing some, some, a little bit of kind of maneuvering to try and find different ways of creating that baseline or what we call your emotional home. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. I so when I when I dive into your work and when I read your books, overall, if I had to sort of describe your approach, I would call it gentle, right? You know, it's like it's very welcoming. It's and you know, it's it's start where you're at, and and we can work on this together. But as we as we dive into like you know being aware of your emotional state, we need elements of you know truth and you know. Yeah sort of recognizing like, this is what it is. How do you bridge those? Like, how do you be gentle with someone that maybe isn't recognizing that their emotional home is anger, you know, and they're freaking yeah. out all the time, but they're in complete denial of that and they just can't see it. Yeah. Such a brilliant question. And just again, just to pause for a moment, as a behaviorist, when people tell me like, oh, your approach is so gentle, it's so kind, I just like marvel because like literally part of my training was how do we get feelings and emotion out of everything? Uh, so I just like, again, I love that it's this like contradiction of this like feeling behaviorist. Um, so just to kind of hold space for that. One of the things when we're working with persons who maybe aren't quite ready yet, right? They're maybe in that that zone where they don't even know what they don't even know. Um, perhaps it's something that's known to us, but not known to them. One of the ways that we can start is asking them whatever they're going through, or if they're asking, you know, if they're showing up with you to ask them, do you need comfort or do you need solutions? Now I'll give you a really quick example. So last year I was having like a little chit chat with my boys. So 19 and 15, and we were talking in the kitchen 
And then all of a sudden their sister came home. And if you've seen a 17 year old girl in the wild, like she was keyed up. Right. And I turned to my boys to suggest that they give their sister like a wide berth is like, give your sister some space boys. They were already gone. It's like, forget like no person get left behind. The boys already left as soon as they saw their sister. And I asked her in that moment, I'm like, I don't know what you're going through. Clearly something, but do you need comfort or solutions right now? And Ava said, mama, I need you to hate math as much as I do right now in this moment. And I'm like, I got you. So we talked everything about what was wrong with math and the grade 11 math curriculum in Ontario. And then when she started to re-regulate, I kind of asked her like, what happened today at school that got you this upset? And she said she was in English class, like literature class. And the teacher said, Ava, what was the last book that you read that made you cry? And she said, calculus. And everyone started to laugh because they wanted like something in fiction and she went there. And so she was feeling really kind of embarrassed and agitated. And the reason I share that is in that moment when she was really keyed up, if I would have, and she said to me, mom, like, I want you to like hate math. And I said, no, 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 we need a solution. We're going to find you a tutor. We're going to put in extra hours. Math is so important. You can't get through life without it. How would that have made her feel? So if we think about people's emotional home, part of it is just making ourselves available to hold space to get some clarity about whether or not do they want comfort or solutions. So let's say if someone's choosing to spend their energy in anger, right? Asking them in that moment, do you want comfort or do you want solutions? Because if they're in a place where they just need comfort, being able to validate it, say, Hey, yeah, I see that you're really angry about this. It's okay to be angry and not make a big deal of it is going to get you farther than if you were to tell a person like you need to change or this isn't working, which creates defensiveness. Kudos to Ava for, for being able to communicate what she needed in that moment. It, it begs the question for me, what would you have done if she wasn't able to, if you would have got the standard, everything's fine. Yeah. So one of the things that I do when we get some of that resistance, right? When we meet some of that, telling somebody everything's fine when it's obviously not fine is what we call like protest behavior. And like, that's when we just get super curious, right? So I would have kind of, I would have like, again, as, as a mom to this particular child, something that I know is like, I would like have physically moved a little bit closer to her just to give her that sense that she's not alone. That, that you don't have to carry this alone by just my body language. Like I would have just gotten a little bit closer. And interestingly, especially when someone's in kind of protest behavior, chances are the people who like need help ask for it in all the wrong ways. So her tendency might be to push away, to put on the headphones, the hoodie, and just kind of tap out. But getting closer is just letting her know she's not alone. And then just ask her, she said, oh, I'm fine. It's like, okay, well, fine looks heavy right now as a big feeling. And my follow-up question would probably be something like, Ava, how's your heart? Like, how is your heart right now? And that's a strategy from uh, Tess Levitt. She's a great um, children advocate who says, you know, encouraging them to pause and just ask them, how is, how is your heart right now? Um, sometimes that can help break through some of that resistance or protest behavior. This is phenomenal. I can already, I'm like learning and I can already <laughs> see future situations with Riley where I'm like, oh, I'm going to Robin's playbook here. Yeah. So oh, and can I give one more gentle little suggestion? If you're going to go to that playbook, we don't want to ever go like, we don't want to ever go to eye to eye. We want to go ear to ear. So that way they know that you are their ally. You are not that you are not that person they're against. Because even from a biological level, when we go eye to eye with someone, and it doesn't have to be a child, it could be a colleague, it could be a difficult client, it could be a, like somebody, even a partner. When we go nose to nose, it actually activates part of our brain that actually says, like, is this threatening? Like, are we are we about to throw hands? But when we go ear to ear, we actually feel like this is someone who's on my side. 
So anytime I'm having a difficult conversation with someone, I sit beside them, not across from them, because that will just start to de-escalate it before it even gets started. So with my teenagers, we do a lot of ear-to-ear conversations, usually with our hands doing something else. So whether that be emptying the dishwasher or going to carpool or, you know, me, um, one of my favorites, I got all of the tea from my teenagers when I actually just kind of sort of started cleaning their room while they're sitting on their bed, Um, right? That's when you can start to get some of that momentum, open the door. And once we open those heart spaces, people tend to be a lot more open to sharing. I'm curious, the doing something with your hands, like, is there what is the reasoning behind that? Is it just lower the threat level or does it distract and lower the guard or? Yeah, we want to, we want to keep ourselves. And in those situations, we want to keep ourselves like slightly distracted enough that we can pay attention. So like we want to be slightly distracted enough by doing something else that it makes it so this doesn't feel as like heavy or as like so intense. Um, It just lightens it ever so slightly. Um, And what's really remarkable, I feel like, unfortunately, from a a gender perspective, um, that males tend to get kind of put in these positions of being known as not good communicators. What we actually see is that in a lot of cases, they have a really effective communication strategy. It's that just that we're kind of struggling around expectations. So for example, like if you can have a really good dialogue when my hands are busy and I'm not really looking at you, but I'm doing something, but I'm listening and we're talking like that actually is a really effective strategy. Whereas unfortunately, a lot of us have been programmed or conditioned that good communication means eye to eye, leaning in, nodding, and don't be distracted. That's a very, very difficult way to communicate, which I think women have been programmed to do a wee bit better. Um, But the reality is it's a lot more comfortable for most of us when we actually stay just slightly distracted. This is fascinating because me, <laughs> me and my wife are literally having conversations about this because we have different communication styles mm-hmm. and I would be more prone. I guess maybe I'm flipping this a little bit. I am more prone. I'm very, I'm listening very intently, but I don't have that like laser lock yeah. stare into the other person's eyes. Right. Yeah. Whereas my wife more so does, right? Like it's yeah. direct eye contact and we'll often have conflict around like, well, you're not listening because you're not looking at me and, and vice versa. So, I mean, that that just blew my mind a bit. Yeah. Well, and again, it's just, it's what's so interesting. It's not that one's like better or worse or one's good or not great. What it is, is like figuring out like, what's our play? Like, what's the, what's the way we can do this? And I can share with you in like my household with, with my husband, um, like, because I'm a mover and I listen well when I'm moving sometimes though, if it's like level 10 critical importance, you know, Jeff will let me know. And he'll like, kind of basically like set me up for success to say, Hey, this is a big one. I need, I need all of you here right now. Like I need all of your attention here right now. And he doesn't use it obviously all the time because not everything is big in a crisis, but when he does like kind of pull that alarm to like, he's like, Hey, I need all of you, like all hands on deck. I need you to hear this. Then it's just like, yeah, absolutely. I'm going to be present in a very different way, but for the majority of the conversations, it's, it's actually helpful. And the other gentle piece I can encourage is, is around a little bit about those kind of expectations. Um, if it's okay, I'll tell you a quick little story. Recently, I was, I was so excited to tell my husband, cause like I had like 12 super exciting things that happened in a short period of time. And I was like, I had this list and I came running home and I'm like, Jeff, I got 12 super exciting things to tell you. And he looked at me and he took a deep breath and he's like, I got space for two. And I was like, no, 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 I, you you didn't hear me. I said 12. He's like, I don't, I don't have it in me to have the level of reaction that you would hope for me to have for you for all 12. I can do two. And what was amazing was just in that moment, recognizing kind of that idea about communication and expectation. So it's not necessarily what we're talking about. It's how we're talking about it. So that way we're on the same page. And when then he shared that he only had room for two, I slowed down long enough to be like, whoa, heck, I didn't even ask, how's your day? And he's like, not great dealing with a major security breach in IT. It's like, okay, so you know what? My 12 can wait. Um, because again, it's just understanding how we set these expectations with no judgment. It's just this idea. It's what we have to offer and bring to the conversation that day. Yeah. That's so beautiful. When, when you can 
when you can communicate at that level on the connection you gain from that, even in a difficult time, as you said, no judgment. Wow. Does that lead to even further connection Mm -hmm. when you get it right? Oh, I I appreciate that. Yes. When you get it right. Robin, can I ask one follow-up question, Mike? Related oh, to I, I guess I have been hogging, we're so far hogging off. the microphone. <laughs> we're so far off. This is good. How are you working with individuals? And I am being, um, uh, I am comparing that many are in virtual or semi-virtual environments now where we are on talks such as this mm-hmm. today, where you're staring at a person across a screen. How are you taking that into effect uh, when attempting to communicate effectively, especially in these yes. situations where there's stress involved? Yeah, Jonathan, I love that question. I think one of the thing it comes down to, regardless of the like medium or how we're communicating, really goes into this idea about intention setting. So one of the things that we see in the research when we lead teams, for example, or we engage in these digital or hybrid environments, one of the things that happen if we're not careful is a lot of our communication becomes very transactional. It's just like, this is what you need to know. It's I need to know what piece of information do you need to do? What's your next steps? And we're missing some of that. We're missing some of the, the people parts. We're missing some of the humanity, the shared you know, conversation, the chit chat that we have sometimes before meetings even start when we're in person. So my gentle invitation is, is setting that intention that we can have really amazing connections in a digital way. Like we can have big, wonderful, you know, audacious goals and dreams happen in digital ways. As long as we go in there with the right intention that we want to make sure it's more than just interactions and transactions that we still remember the people on the other side of these two dimensional screens. Great answer. Thank you. You're welcome. I, I like the piece of setting intention. I try to remember to do that setting out, like even for these podcasts, you know, yeah some themes we want to hit on, some intention for it, but mm-hmm. who knows? We end up in some different spots. Mm-hmm. Uh, one question, Robin. Now, this is not in the book. This is me as one of the best benefits ever of hosting a podcast and getting to speak with various experts is we get to scratch our curiosity. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I'm part of a mastermind group and we were kicking around this thing. I guess it actually has a term. It's called the region beta paradox. Mm-hmm. And it's loosely defined as being in a really bad situation can actually be beneficial because it will encourage you to take action. Yeah. Whereas being in a situation that, you know, it's not great, but I can tolerate it for a while. So I won't actually take any action. And I'm very curious your thoughts. I mean, number one on just, is that all kind of a sham or is there some truth to it? But number two is for those people that are in that middle zone where, okay, this is not 10 out of 10 crisis situation and everything is falling apart, but it sure doesn't feel good. And it's definitely Mm -hmm. not in alignment. And all of a sudden they wake up and they've been there for a year or two. How do you help them get to the point, like you said earlier of when they're ready? Yeah. Yeah. It's such a big question. And I appreciate you asking it. So first we know that we do all have what we call like a threshold of tolerance. So depending on how we're feeling, depending on our general baseline of wellness, our threshold for tolerance is going to look different. And a very simple example is if you have a great night's sleep and you're well-rested and well-resourced, it's really easy to make healthy food decisions. It's really easy to make good decisions professionally and personally. However, if you haven't had a good night's sleep and you're feeling perhaps really unseen and you're just feeling like, you know, you're being taken advantage of your threshold tolerance is going to look very, very different. And it's going to take a lot more effort and energy and intention to stay aligned with your goals and your values and that idea of like showing up with your best self. So do I think that there's like value in that, that philosophy about our thresholds? Absolutely. Now the question about readiness was interesting People will change with one kind of key ingredient if we kind of like distilled all of the information about change readiness and what the research says, basically when they get tired of their own bullshit, like that is when people actually change is when they get sick and tired of themselves, that they can't even find a place to, you know, reconcile it or justify it anymore. Like they just eventually get to the point where they're like, this is not okay. Now, in psychology, a theme or a way or a theory that we talk about often is the thermostat. 
technology or this idea, which is, you know, we all kind of have these like thermostats set in different areas of our life. So let's take our physical wellness. So let's say my physical wellness is set at a good thermostat setting of 75. And then I notice I've kind of maybe missed a few workouts and perhaps I'm not really taking care of myself. I'm not prioritizing sleep. And then all of a sudden that thermostat drops to like 65. And all of a sudden it's like, whoa, this is not me. I don't feel good. I don't feel good in my skin. I don't feel good energetically. I got to change my behavior. We dial in that nutrition. We get more active. We get some good night sleeps. And then all of a sudden that thermostat, we're going to rise. Maybe we're back at 75 or maybe we jump all the way to 85 because we've like really got some good momentum. Now we can stay there for a while, but then all of a sudden that's going to actually not feel very good. It's going to feel too hard to maintain. It's going to feel like, whoa, other stuff is starting to slip. And then we kind of regress back to our baseline of 75. So what we see in terms of change in those thresholds, it really depends on where we're starting and where it is that we're hoping to go and really the quality of the days and the experiences that we're hoping for. Interesting. How, how do I move the baseline? So oh, using, for example, uh, my baseline physical 75 yeah. and I would like to move it to 78 or whatever. Yeah. First of all, I want to hold space to say, I love that your increment was by three um, and not by, I want to take 75 to 95. Um, so just to recognize like small behavioral changes, consistency compounds, and that's actually how we get the best change. And the way that we actually do it, interestingly enough, in the research that we see is around working with our identity recognizing that like we are, um, we embrace these practices and what we want to do is always be in alignment with our identity. So for example, instead of saying like, I'm somebody who wants to get more activity in my day, I'm somebody that I walk in the morning, no matter what I am somebody rain, shine, sleep, minus 40 plus 20 doesn't matter. I'm somebody who walks every morning and I make sure no matter what, I get a walk in before lunchtime. So when we embrace these like non-negotiables around our identity, what happens over time is that that thermometer, that um, thermostat starts to get these new increments and the smaller the increment, the more lasting we see those behavioral changes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm big on that, you know, outcome based versus identity and whatnot. Yeah. I do want to dive in. So I know in your book, you talk about eight different realms of wellness mm -hmm. and physical is one of them. Yeah. One of the ones I wanted to pull out was financial. Mm -hmm. And the reason I'm pulling that out, so this episode will air in late 2023. And the the world or the conversations I'm having around finances seem very heavy. Like everyone, yeah. the, the common comment is everything is so expensive. Right? And even our audience here being veterinary professionals, um, you know, we're all quite privileged. We all are probably gainfully employed. And on the spectrum of humanity, we're doing very well financially, yet everything still feels heavy. Yeah. How do we tie this together? Because using the two examples we've discussed, if I'm feeling financially scarce, I am going to skip that walk in the morning and go to work to make money, to try to feel less financially scarce? Yeah, you're asking a great question. And what, again, finances and financial wellness is one of the eight. So we know, for example, we, we have to ensure that we're nurturing each one of those eight realms, even just a wee bit to be able to get the best benefit for what we would consider living the good life. Now, interestingly, why financial is so important, and again, the timeliness of this conversation is so important, is that when we experience any type of um, a situation in our finances that brush against our money story that we all carry, we all have a money story, what happens for some people, it could be really, you know, it could be positive, but for the majority of persons, the money stories that we believe to be true tend to be quite triggering. There tend to be lots of feelings around scarcity, about feelings of not enough. Um, again, it moves us away from that sufficiency mindset where we trust we are able to meet our needs and we'll always be okay to that place of, again, that lack, that scarcity, which means 
all of a sudden that gets all of our energy and all of our focus and the other areas get neglected. Um, so one of the kind of first places we start around it is just being open and honest with like, what is the money story? Um, you know, what did, what was, what were we taught about money growing up? What were the themes or the, how money was role modeled to us growing up? Because our early exposure to those money stories, those are deep, deep trenches in our brain. That's going to have an impact on our wellness. So if we are in that place of everything's feeling really expensive and, you know, this is really challenging and interest rates are going up and what does that mean? And debt is becoming more complicated. What we have to understand is that's going to trigger something within us. And we want to know how do we work with those anxiety moments or how do we work with that fear in a way that's actually productive in a way that actually keeps us moving in a positive direction. Yeah. I, I feel like I've done a lot of work in that realm. Mm -hmm. And I have a new money story, you know, that I've worked on. But as soon as you said that the old stories are very deep and it's like, they're right there. Like that's, they're still default mode where I can drop right back to those stories that, you know, whether they were true or false, I grabbed onto when I was five or 10 and have just held on to them my whole life. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what's so interesting about the practice of stressing wisely. It's holding enough like spaciousness to recognize when we are experiencing overwhelm or we're not well resourced or we're feeling a little bit depleted, all of those old parts tend to get magnified and those feelings start to get amplified because we know that's part of how our nervous system works because ultimately the reason why it's reminding you of some of those deep trenches of your money stories, ultimately your nervous system is just trying to keep you safe. It just wants you to be okay. So it's not our enemy. It's just this, it's like our first line of defense to say like, hey, hey, remember, this could be really scary and I don't want you to experience this. Put some energy and focus behind it. So a way that we can meet some of those big feelings, especially when it's something like anxiety, anxiety needs to be actioned, right? Anxiety needs to be actioned. If we keep it by itself, it just festers. Anxiety needs to be actioned. So, okay, if I'm feeling a little bit overwhelmed right now, what is two things that I can do that are within my control that will help mitigate some of those feelings of scarcity? What are two things? And you want, it might be canceling a subscription, right? It could be dialing in one particular habit or hobby that you might have and then say, okay, thank you nervous system for letting me know those are two actions I took and your nervous system said, my job is done. I am an early detection system. My job is done. Now carry on. And so if we action it, it actually makes a big difference. We don't have to solve all of it. We just need to do steps in the right direction. Interesting. I'm, I'm laughing currently uh, for our North American listeners, the NAVLI. So the North American Veterinary Licensing Exam is underway and everyone writes on different days. And I am picturing those that have it coming up in the near future, having spotless rooms because that was my go-to when you're like, yeah. I'm anxious. I'm supposed to be studying. I have a big exam. I better clean my room or I better clean. And there I've done something, nothing to do with what's actually making me anxious, but yeah. I've taken some action. Absolutely. That's Mike, why. Yeah. Mike is pretending he actually studied right now. <laughs> no, I cleaned. I cleaned. <laughs> I love it. My favorite for anyone taking tests, my favorite little mindset trick is when you get there and you're sitting down or if you're doing it virtual, just take a moment and just like take a good deep breath, right? Send all of that oxygen rich blood to your brain, get a nice deep breath and just say, this is a celebration of what I know. This is a celebration of what I know, maybe what I don't know, but what I know and I can't do any more in this moment than just show up for this. Right. I can't sit there and think about, oh, I should have studied more. I should have gone to that workshop or I should have read that manual or taken that course that teaches you how to have a quick fix to do well on these uh, licensing exams. In that moment, it's a celebration of what you know and just trust your prior knowledge. Like if you can write an exam in a state of confidence and trust, like you're going to do appreciably better, even if you've studied well, but you're experiencing anxiety. Right. So even just, again, leaning into the prior knowledge and uh, trust yourself. So it's a celebration of what, you know, is my little way of helping persons show up for those tests. 
I would love to know, because we're coming close here, sure. for those that are going, what are these eight realms of wellness, Robin? What are they? I love that question. So we have, of course, the physical, right? That's one of the ones we often think about most, but we also have the emotional realm, which is this idea that our thoughts and our feelings, that they need a safe place to land, that we need to make space for them. We also know there's an intellectual realm, which is around critical thinking and problem solving, learning, imagining, creativity. We also know that there's a social realm, which is our relationships and place and space in our immediate circles, but also in the world. We see an environmental realm. And I love the example that Mike gave about like, you know, when he was nervous, he cleaned his room because our environments have a huge impact on our mood and our sense of wellness, as well as the big world. We also have financial, occupational, and the last one is spiritual. And what we were able to see in our research is if we can do just a wee bit of tender attention to each one of those, we actually know it creates this foundation in which people are able to show up even in difficult seasons. Excellent. And my assumption is there's not one that's more important than the other, or am I wrong in that assumption? I love the assumption. And what I would say is that there will be one that's more important in the season that you are in. So there's going to be a season when, you know what, it's going to be about community. It's going to be about social. It's going to be about showing up for one another. Um, so, you know what, in that particular season, it's going to be social. And there'll be another time when it's going to be one of the other realms. So what I encourage people to do is really take a moment to discern what would be the area that will give me the best return on my investment to focus on right now to create a little bit of positive momentum towards the changes that I'm hoping to experience. Love that. Thank you. You're welcome. I, I do have a quick follow-up on that. I'll be very quick sure. on it. I picture we can take the eight rounds, we plot them and pretend it's a wheel and in, yeah. a, in a perfect world, it's a perfectly circle, but mm -hmm. that's, that's not realistic. If it's unbalanced, do you focus on your strengths or do you head to the weakness? So like, you know, one of them is scoring a 62 or whatever the number is. And one of them's an 85. Yeah. So my big, my encouragement there is like, you are your own expert. Go with what you know has worked in the past. So like if what works for you in the past, let's say if you're feeling overwhelmed and it is cleaning up that room, if it is getting physical order in your space, if you know that's a go-to that's worked, invest in your strengths, invest in what you know works. Unfortunately, what we see often happens, most people will think that they need a solution that's external to them or one that they haven't discovered yet. And the way I love to think about this is success, your success, it leaves clues. Your success leaves clues behind. Go back, do a wee bit of a self-check and be like, okay, when I was feeling this in the past, what was my strategy that was helpful? Be also mindful of what was my strategy that I used that might have been maladaptive. So for example, maybe you're feeling overwhelmed and you're like, oh, well, I can actually, you know, I could maybe make an appointment with a friend that, hey, we're going to talk each week for 30 minutes to hold ourselves accountable and get back on track. We're going to have a 30 minute once a week, you know, um, recurring appointment to do this or I can close down and I can just watch Sons of Anarchy for the 40th time. And maybe, you know, that's going to help. Right. So again, it's discerning in my past. What are the clues that success has shown me? Which ones were adaptive? Which ones were maladaptive? And put my energy on the adaptive ones. I like it. Thank you, Robin. I knew the time would fly and it has. And it's been excellent. I have two pages of notes that I've been jotting down. Of course, the book uh, for everyone is Stress Wisely. Where can people, you know, A, find the book and B, get in touch with you, follow you if they're so inclined? Oh, well, thank you, gentlemen, for having me. I love these conversations. So I hope uh, we'll be able to have more in the future. Most of my material, it, the easiest way to get it is through my website, drrobin.ca. Um, and all of the resources are there and lots of open resources and lots of information about upcoming events. So please feel free to check it out. And that's Dr. Robin. And Robin has an E. You bet. And we'll put that in the show notes. Thanks. Thank you so much for joining us. I mean, it's, it's always a pleasure. Any Any last words for you, Jonathan? 
Oh, every time I have these amazing conversations and learnings, I go, there is hours of work to do. So I really appreciate coming on, sharing with us, Robin. Um, it's amazing to, uh, one, be able to reconnect with you and then see again in the last two and a half years where the life has taken you. We had a little bit of discussion pre-recording. Look forward to continue this relationship together. So thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. All right, Robin, we're not going to run you through the the full impact round because you have already done that, but we will give the final word to you. What message would you like to leave for the veterinary community? The message I would like to leave for the veterinary community is that one of the greatest hedges of protection around your emotional health and your mental health is to keep top of mind that the work you're doing is a noble pursuit. The work that you're doing matters. It matters so much to the lives in the communities. Um, we know that animals and all of the like are so important uh, in our mental health, for our emotional health. So just again, remembering that the work you're doing, it is the most noble pursuit, um, being able to support each other and one another. So thank you for your service. Thank you for listening to the Veterinary Project Podcast. As a recap, on behalf of our hosts, the Veterinary Project Podcast will be releasing new episodes weekly. So be sure to tune in as we bring you more conversations aimed at helping you enjoy a life well lived. If you enjoyed what you heard on the show and you want to stay in the know, please like, love, and or subscribe to the podcast on the listening platform of your choosing, as we're available on all the usual suspects. If you know of others that may benefit from these conversations, we'd love it if you please share the show with them, as this will help us grow our community to reach more and more veterinary professionals. Speaking of which, if you are a veterinary professional and would like to get connected with more like-minded individuals who are joining us on this journey, please send an email to the Veterinary Project Podcast at gmail.com, and we'll invite you to be a part of our private Facebook group. General feedback, requests for information, or perhaps requests to be a guest on the show can also be sent to the Veterinary Project Podcast at gmail.com. Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light, thank you for listening to the show, and we'll catch you again next week for another episode of the Veterinary Project Podcast. Bye for now. Bye for now.